Hey everybody, James with My British Supply Love My Pups. Um, I'm going to do a 12 part video on coat colour genetics. Um, and approximately this is what we're going to be doing here. So I don't promise that that's going to be exactly the way it's going to work out. Remember, two things. First off is that I'm not a vet or a geneticist. So all the information you get from me, take it all with a grain of salt. Best that I know it is correct. Learned it over the last 15 years. Um, but if you like us, please subscribe to us. And we have some wonderful products at My Breeder Supply. All of these things are developed by us. Some of them are patented. Everything that we have up there are things that we use on a day-to-day -day basis. We strongly recommend and believe those are the best ways to do things. Anyway, here we go. So today we're going to talk about DNA and what DNA is and how the whole process works. We're going to talk about Punnett squares and how you can decide what the outcomes would be of two breedings. We're going to talk about all the colors, all the colors that you're going to see on a DNA report. We're going to talk about them briefly. Then we're going to talk about standard colors, the standard colors that you see in the show ring. Then we're going to talk about the A locus, Pied locus, Blue dogs, Chocolate dogs, Lilac dogs, Platinum dogs, Moral dogs, Fluffy dogs, and the Intensity gene. So let's get to it. Okay, so I think it's uh, we're not going to go into this in any great detail, but I think it makes sense that we can talk about how DNA comes about and what the heck is going on. So, <clears throat> in every cell of every creature, um, ah, it's not, there are some creatures that don't have this process, but for the majority, DNA is the fundamental driver of deciding what offspring an animal produces. And inside these cells are chromosomes. And inside those chromosomes is strands of DNA. And we're going to do a representation of a DNA strand. So here's a DNA strand, and it's what's called a double helix. It's two strands wound together, and there are <clears throat> proteins that link these together. And the way they link together is the genetic code of what's inside that animal. I'm not going to do, just, we'll just do it like this. But these are the genetic, these are basically the cross links. <clears throat> and that then, that strand of DNA describes you and me and everybody else in complete detail. You can take that piece of DNA and you can make another of you or another of me or a slug or, or a dog. So what happens is that when two um, similar, two species get together, this DNA strand breaks and you take one half of the DNA strand from one of the parents and that connects to one of the DNA strands of the other to produce a new offspring with new combinations of this genetic code that links these two together. And what it amounts to is, is that every single human being on this planet has unique DNA. The DNA that you have is only the same as an identical twin. If you have an identical twin, you have the same DNA. And that's, that's because um, an egg is formed and that egg then splits in two and one half of that egg and the other half that are exactly the same then produce two separate offspring and they're identical. So that's an unusual situation. But normally what happens is, is that every single animal on this earth has a unique DNA pattern that describes exactly what that animal is. And that's, by the way, if you commit a crime and uh, they collect some DNA off the crime scene, they can see whether it was you that was there or not. So we can do the same thing. You know, you can do a DNA test on one of your dogs and uh, you can either do a cheek swab. You can do remove a piece of the animal, which might be a dew claw, might be a tail. Um, or uh, you can prick a, a paw and get some blood, and you can send those off to Animal Genetics, UC Davis, VetGen, Embark, all of those people do specific DNA tests to find out particular traits of the dog that you've produced. They won't do a complete DNA profile. The first, the first DNA profile, uh, the, uh, um, the human uh, biome was done and I think it's probably 10 years ago now, might be 15 years ago, at the expense of many, many, many millions and millions of dollars. These days, you can get a complete DNA test done of yourself for a few hundred bucks. Find out everything about yourself. 
Okay. So, look, this is, you don't have to understand this in any detail uh, <clears throat> to understand what we're going to be talking about with dog genetics. But I just think it's interesting and, and, and fundamentally you can understand a little bit about what this process is. And look, I, there's a lot more to it than what I just put up on the board. I know a fair amount about it, but I certainly don't know, you know, <laughs> there's so much to learn about this. It's, you can spend a lifetime just learning about uh, genetics, just, just that portion of it. Anyway, so now let's talk about, um, so uh, Mendelssohn, by the way, who was a, a, a monk, was the first person who really come up with what the hell's going on with DNA. And he did um, experiments in his garden with the sweet peas. And from the color of the sweet peas that he'd produced, he figured out how all this genetics works. So let's talk about you and me and other people watching this and eye color. We're just going to start there. So let's talk about me. I have brown eyes. I've got brown eyes. <clears throat> My wife has blue eyes. These markers suck. Let's see if we can find a different marker here. My wife has, there we go, she has blue eyes. What could we expect our children to have? So the answer is, is there's, there's genes that come in two different forms. They are either dominant. In fact, we're going to put that as the brown pen because brown happens to be a dominant gene. And here's the brown one. Sorry about this. Let's wipe that off. <clears throat> genes come, genes, every animal has two genes that make up the attribute we're talking about. This goes back to this double helix. There's two genes, and each one of these gets split in two, and there's two genes. So you take one gene from one parent, one gene from the other parent. Those two genes make up the two genes that then make up that particular trait in the offspring. So there's always two genes. Right, well, it turns out that there are dominant and recessive genes. The blue eye gene, we're gonna call that B for blue, is a double recessive. You have to have two copies of the recessive blue gene to end up with blue eyes. If you don't have that, then you end up with brown eyes, and that ends up being that. BB is a brown eyed person. But since it only takes one copy of a dominant gene, that also makes up a brown eyed person. So a brown eyed person can either have two copies of the dominant brown gene or just one copy of the, of the, of the, of the dominant gene. Sorry, the blue eye gene. One copy of the blue eye gene or two copies of a two dominant make up for a, blue, a brown eyed person. Two copies of the recessive blue end up with a blue eyed person. So all blue eyed people on this planet, we know what they are. All brown eyed people like me could either have two copies of the dominant version or one copy of the recessive, one copy of the dominant. So we do a thing called a Punnett square. And a Punnett square, and you'll see me talking about this quite a bit in other videos, is a very simple way of deciding what you're going to get when you put two people together, two dogs together, two flies together, and you're going to look at a particular genetic trait, in this case, blue eye color. So in this case here, here's me, and I happen to be, um, I am one copy of the dominant and one copy of the uh, recessive gene for, for the eye color. Tammy has two copies of uh, recessive. So what we do is we look at, see how these combine up and put them in squares. You, by the way, by convention, you always put recessive as little lowercase and dominant as uppercase. And typically when you show something, you show the recessive gene first. And then if there's a, excuse me, a dominant gene first and then a recessive gene afterwards. And that would be the way that you'd write me. Now, if, if you wrote it down like this, it's exactly the same thing. There's no order that matters here, but it's just from convention, you put down the, the dominant gene first. Okay, so here's me and Tammy. So what do we get? Well, some of the time I give out this gene, some of the time she gives out this gene. So that particular offspring ends up with that genetic code. That's a brown eyed person. This one and this one, she gets a little B from me, a little B from Tammy. That one ends up being a blue eyed person. 
This one here gets this one and this one. We've got another brown eyed person, this one, this one. And there we go. So what would you expect eye color in our children? And the answer is you'd expect one half to be blue eyed and one half to be brown eyed, but be blue eyed carriers. So we're brown, brown eyed but with blue eyed carriers. So that's what we'd expect. Okay, so now let's just go a little bit further with this and let's see what happens if we take these, um, these traits and put them back together again. So what happens if you put two people who have brown eyes? Okay, so here come the brown eyed people. So we're gonna make, we're gonna do this as two, two different ways. The first one is we're gonna say, we've got a brown eyed person who has children with another brown eyed person, but they both carry a single copy also of the recessive blue gene. What do you get? Well, here and here, you get totally a brown eyed person. Here and here, you get a brown eyed person that carries the blue, the blue eyes. This one here, same thing. And lo and behold, there is a blue eyed person. So one quarter of the offspring have blue eyes. And um, three quarters are, are, are brown eyed, of which one quarter have two copies of brown eyes. All right, so that was that. Let's go one more step further. So let's put, here's an interesting one. Let's put two blue-eyed people together. So here's the blue-eyed people. What do you get? Every child has blue eyes. So that's an interesting one. I get people in trouble that one, Will. Because if, if you and your spouse both have blue eyes, but you produce a child that doesn't have blue eyes, someone's been being naughty. So I don't reckon any marriages by bringing that up. But uh, so Punnett Square, very easy way of deciding what's going on when you want to look at these particular traits. So I think that that is really all that we're gonna talk about in this particular video. Next video, we're gonna talk about all the colors that are available. So thanks for watching, bye.